Um, I'll try and tell more stories in the future. <sighs> we, we, might, we might be able to do the next few topics quickly. All right. And we'll see whether we can. Thanks, guys. Good. The big hand's pointing past the three. Let's talk about it. So we're now going to talk about phases of matter because you know, it's good to formally introduce that. I think we actually talked a lot about uh, what I want to cover here in the last section, but I want to represent the information a little bit differently. Um, this chart on the bottom right should not surprise you. Okay, melting and freezing, um, sublimation and deposition, I always forget deposition, um, condensation and evaporation. And we can go between all three. We'll talk about why as we go. Who hasn't seen uh, the sublimation of CO2 solid crystals? Hasn't seen? Who has seen the sublimation of solid crystals of CO2? Yeah? Where? Where do you get exposed to that? Dry ice. Dry ice? Yes. So that's exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, so you can buy dry ice, which is solid CO2, and it, um, it sublimates. It doesn't become a liquid before it becomes a gas. Um, it hurts because it's cold. Don't pick it up. Um, solid liquids and gases. We all were. And some of us still are. No, solids and gases. So this is trying to represent molecular level. So solids, everything's um, crystalline and, and ordered and so forth. We will call that for our purposes incompressible. You can compress it a little bit, but um, really not very much. Liquids, so you can see the molecules are a little further apart. Um, that's true in everything except water, unfortunately. Well, fortunately for a bunch of reasons. Um, liquids tend to stay together. They're attracted, all right? But um, everything moves freely. They take the shape of the container in which they're, they're put. Gas, the molecules are very far apart. Um, density is low. It will fill a whole container, not just fill the, the lower end of a shape. And gases are compressible. So we can bring the molecules closer together. There's lots of free space between them. And rarefy them, we can um, move the molecules further apart. The reason that substances tend to exist in these forms is that unlike the ideal gas equation purports, that molecules are actually attracted to each other. Like molecules are attracted to each other. And what we find is that if there was no thermal energy, so there's no movement, right, things would become solids. And we, because they have the tendency to stick together. And we find that we actually need thermal energy. If, you, if you're happy to think from zero Kelvin and think up, right, you actually need thermal energy to break those bonds. Okay? And that's the point at which they escape, the molecules escape that particularly liquid phase. Right, they escape and become gaseous. When we talk about temperature, we tend to think of temperature as being like a fixed point. So if you said that something was 20 degrees C, then all of the molecules are at 20 degrees C. But we know that temperature is a macroscopic measurement. The individual molecules have energy. They don't actually have temperature in and of themselves. And indeed, if we looked at the number of molecules, that's an N. Let me get that. Ooh. That's an N, all right? The number of molecules that are at some given energy, we actually find that we get a distribution around some median point. Okay? And so some of the molecules have got a little bit less energy, so they're off to the left. Some of the molecules have got a little bit more energy, they're off to the right. And when a high energy molecule bumps into a low energy molecule, they might swap. One becomes lower, one becomes higher. Um, and over time, this distribution doesn't tend towards a point. It actually tends towards the distribution. This is called thermal equilibrium, and you have some distribution. Uh, there's a I think it's called Boltzmann's distribution, but that might be just for gases. I don't know whether he also has liquids. So some of these bonds, right, if you had some threshold um, energy required, so this is a liquid, if you had some threshold energy required for molecules to escape from the liquid and become, you know, go into the gas, all right, then these molecules here would all evaporate. So they're just those very high energy molecules would evaporate and the distribution would shift to the left. Okay? 
and the distribution would shift as molecules evaporate. So evaporation lowers the overall energy in a system, right? So when it evaporates, it gets cold. Um, yeah, that's what we, what we think of as cold. Now, what does pressure do in this system? Pressure moves this line, okay? So at higher pressures, the line moves over here, okay? At higher pressures, if you've got a liquid, the molecules need more energy to come from a liquid into this gaseous state. And the reason is, so there's already gas above it, otherwise there'd be no pressure, so there's already something going around above it, okay? And the gas is bearing down on the liquid and forcing the molecules to stay in solution, okay? At low pressure, that moves the line over here, moves the line to the left. And we find that it's easier for molecules to go from a liquid state into the gas state, um, so it's easier for them to evaporate. So this is just a different way of saying the same thing. At higher pressures, liquids boil at a higher temperature, and at lower pressures, liquids boil at a lower temperature. And that boiling takes with it energy, um, and condensation gives the energy back. So if a molecule from the vapor space, um, so they're going really fast, and they're really rarefied, if that impinges on liquid surface and stays there, then some of that energy that's carrying, because it's going really fast, has to be distributed into the molecules of liquid. That might be a different molecule will then evaporate and go out into the vapor phase, or it might be that it stays condensed, adds to the mass of the condensation, um, but the temperature of the condensate has to rise because it's got more internal energy at that point. Um, so just trying to give it to you a couple of different ways. Um, pressure tends to compress substances. Temperature tends to expand a substance. Um, ice is almost unique in that when it turns from the liquid phase to the solid phase, it does what? It expands, right? That's, that's very unusual among substances. It has to do with um, the way that H2O is orientated. And as a liquid, it can go around itself a lot more easily. And as a solid, it has to expand to take up its crystalline form. Um, but that's unusual. So with um, the liquid phase to solid phase, transition as well. If you compress a substance, it tends to help it freeze. So if you compress a liquid, it tends to help it freeze, except for water, where if you rarefy it, it helps it freeze, which is also potentially counterintuitive. And we'll see that when we look at the PVT chart. Um, all substances, oh, yep, all substances that we deal with have a sublimation pressure. So at low pressures, um, for example, so liquid uh, ice water, so H2O as ice, will sublimate to H2O at a vapor at very low pressures. For CO2, dry ice, the, um, where we get to see that, uh, the pressure above which, so um, the pressure at which you get liquid CO2, is about five atmospheres, I think. So you need a pressure above five atmospheres, and then if you had solid CO2, it would melt to become liquid CO2, and if you continued heating it, it would become gaseous CO2, um, and it wouldn't sublimate. So at high pressures, you can get CO2 to not sublimate. At low pressures, you can get water to sublimate. Um, and it's below 61 pascals which is the number we've seen before. Um, at an exact pressure and temperature, solids, liquids, and gases all exist. The definition of the, um, of the Celsius is that water freezes at zero and it boils at 100 degrees C. That was good enough when Celsius was doing its thing. It's not good enough for us because we know that local atmospheric pressure differences can change that 100. Um, so the Kelvin isn't defined as degrees C plus 274.15. Sorry, I've got the critical point of critical temperature of water, mate. Um, so Celsius is defined as Kelvin plus 
273.15 nowadays. Kelvin is defined as zero Kelvin is no molecular motion. So, yeah, because temperatures measure molecular motion. And 273.16 Kelvin is the triple point of water. So Kelvin is defined between absolute zero and what we'll call a triple point of water. Can we throw up? So, if you can get some point, so it's a high pressure at which a solid becomes a liquid then becomes a gas, and a low pressure at which a solid just becomes a gas, then you should be able to find an exact pressure and indeed temperature, right? An exact pressure and a temperature at which you could have a solid phase and a liquid phase and a gas phase all in the same container, right? So it's one substance, water, we can take water. So you can get solid water and then liquid water and gaseous water all happening in the same container. It only happens at a very specific pressure and it happens at a specific temperature. The temperature is 0 0.01 degrees C. 0 0.01 degrees C or 273.16 Kelvin. All right. And that's how the Kelvin's defined. The Celsius is now defined off the Kelvin. The Fahrenheit's defined off the Celsius. It's dreadful. So, fascinatingly, the triple point of water is above 0 degrees C. And this is because because water wants to expand as it freezes, if you compress it, then you prevent it from freezing. So atmospheric pressure prevents water from freezing a little bit. If you rarefy the atmosphere a bit, so you reduce the pressure, it can freeze more easily, meaning that if water freezes at a higher temperature at lower pressures. Only a little bit higher. It's not much, but it's, you know, it's interesting. Um, and that's also why our table stops at 0 0.01. Because below the triple point, um, we can't use water as a liquid and vapor because it won't exist in the liquid phase. Liquid in the, it'll exist in the solid phase and in the vapor phase. Cool. Is anyone surprised by that? Anyone heard that before? Anyone's like, yes, I knew what the triple point was. Good. Physics, chemistry? Physics? Do we do it in physics at this uni? No, that's fine. Good, don't worry. Sorry. Not to put you on the spot. At high temperatures, high pressures don't cause condensation, so this is super critical. You can't compress atmospheric air at atmospheric temperatures until it becomes a, um, a liquid. It just doesn't condense. That's called a supercritical substance, and the critical point is at the peak of our um, saturated vapor, saturated liquid line. So we've talked about supercritical substances. That was what I want to talk about, phases of matter. I think, cool. If we represented this, I'll show you this 3D thing in a moment, we can represent this not as a, as a table or as a selection of 2D charts, we can actually represent it as a 3D chart. And this is what it looks like for substances that contract upon freezing. Okay, so this is things that aren't water. I don't want to spend a lot of time in it, but I'll, pre I'll present the material. Have a look if you like charts and visualizations. This might help you. Okay, and so this is an example of a solid. We're tracking temperature on that axis. We're tracking volume, so specific volume on that axis, and we're tracking pressure on that axis. Right? So we've got some substance at a very low temperature. Um, a low, which we're isoth um, isobaric, so we're keeping the pressure constant. As you heat the substance up, it slightly increases its volume. Well, that's a slight wedging. Slightly increases its volume. As it melts, it increases its volume more. It gets a slight increase in volume as it goes from just melted to just vapor. Gets a large increase in volume at a constant pressure and a constant temperature. Right, so this line here is. Um, P is a constant and T is a constant. And then when it's all boiled at the constant pressure, it gets volume change and temperature change as well. Um, there's a PT representation of that. 
for ice, for water, H2O, you get a slightly different effect. You get an increase in volume and then a decrease in volume as it melts. And then it increases in volume just ever so slightly till it boils, has a constant pressure, constant temperature at boiling, and then will boil and follow that surface. So it's a 3D representation of some 2D info. It includes solids. Um, if, you, if that helps you, that information is certainly there. And you can look at it. There's a PT chart of the same thing. This I was going to show, but I already have. This is Sengel and Bowles's uh, temperature entropy chart for water, for H2O. Um, and we'll talk more about that later. So getting back to the state postulate. So for PV equals MRT, right? PV equals MRT, which is not relevant when we're talking about pure substances, but that's what we used for ideal gases. Okay, but for that, it was enough to know pressure and temperature, or temperature and specific volume, or mass and, I don't know, what, what's the other two? There's only three things. If you know any two of them, you can describe the whole state of the system. For a pure substance, that's not true if you know pressure and temperature. Because if I had a box on stage, and I told you that the pressure was uh, one atmosphere and the temperature was 100 degrees, you now know it could be fully water, quality of zero. It could be fully steam, quality of 100 or 100% 100 or quality of one. Right? You don't know what the internal energy is, what the enthalpy is, what the entropy is. Um, so we need something else to define um, our state of our system, which is why the properties need to be independent intensive properties. So pressure and temperature at saturation are not independent. So they don't meet the requirement for the state postulate. Um, just thought that was worth mentioning. So that's there. Give it a look if you like it. Let's talk about this. We'll do a calculation maybe. Oh, good. It's a voting exercise. I always find these fun. Um, if 100 grams of ice at 0 degrees C is added to 200 grams of water at 50 degrees C, what is the temperature at thermal equilibrium? So it's adiabatic. We've got our, our glass back. So ice is down here at 0. Call that 0 and we call that 50. Because if you think it's above 50, this is not the room for you. right? Have a chat with your neighbor. Commit to something. Where along the wall? So you've got less ice than you have water. So we're looking at mass. We've got ice. I think the result's surprising. In 20 seconds or less, where do you think it is? Talk to your neighbor, commit to something. You should know. Easy. Good. Committed. Who's locked in? Radio, uh, who said above 25 degrees C? Just show of hands. Above 25 degrees C. Below 25 degrees C. Below 25 degrees C has it. Above 10 degrees C. Below 10 degrees C. That feels like an even mix. All right, good. That feels like about the, about the transition point. Cool. I've done this on stage. Boil a kettle, add heat without changing the temperature. So what's happening to the energy? We know we're putting in heat, or in that case, electrical work, but call it heat. Um, so delta U, so we must be having a change of internal energy in a closed system. Um, we've got Q minus W. If we had an ideal gas, we would use CV delta T, um, but we don't have a change in temperature, right? So we've got no delta T, so something has to be happening to the energy. And what we get is called the enthalpy of vaporization or the enthalpy of, uh, of melting in that case. So this is heat added to a system. So heat added Q on the x-axis and temperature on the y-axis. If you take ice at minus 25 and add some heat, you very quickly get to water at zero. It holds at zero as you add more heat as it melts. Right? And so this heat here 
is the enthalpy of melting, enthalpy of melting. The water will get hot as you add heat and then it stops at 100 degrees C for one atmosphere and then it boils and this is the enthalpy of vaporization. And then once it's all boiled, the temperature starts going up again. Um, we call this heat latent heat. Yeah, go. No worries, yep, good. No worries. So we'll call this uh, latent enthalpy or latent heat. Um, so when we say latent, we're talking about the heat associated with a phase change. If you hear the term sensible heat, you're talking about the heat associated with a rise in temperature. Um, and if you're talking about an air conditioning system, you care about people because people add sensible heat to a room. They, they, rise, they raise the temperature of the room and they also add humidity to a room because they sweat, they've got evaporation, so we call that latent heat. And you need to remove both in an air conditioning system uh, in order to create a comfortable environment for people to be in. Uh, we're not, um, we're less interested in things freezing. Um, we use enthalpy rather than internal energy for this calculation because enthalpy H equals U plus PV. All right? And if we're talking about a constant pressure process particularly, rather than isochoric process, um, we've got some energy required to expand the substance. And that's accounted for in enthalpy. It's not accounted for in internal energy. Um, and so we care about the enthalpy and we find that figure is represented here. So HFG is the difference between HG. It's HG minus HF. And so that for us is how much enthalpy is associated in vaporizing that um, substance at that pressure and temperature. So that's your enthalpy of vaporization. You've also got an enthalpy of melting. Um, I won't do the calculation but the answer is between five and 10 degrees. So it ends up being quite like, which I think is surprisingly cold. I think that's, um, it's colder than what I would expect. You've got less ice than you do have water. This is why adding a few ice cubes to a drink from the fridge keeps it very cold for a while. Cool. Yep. Go, go, go. The heat associated with phase change. Questions, thoughts, concerns. I'm glad we've spent a little bit of time on this. I'm going to continue the same lecture tomorrow. I'm not worried by the time that's taken to get through. But we should talk about thermodynamic property tables as well. We might do interpolation tomorrow. Cool. This is now, so uh, this is like, now we're getting into thermodynamics. Now, we, now we're talking about moving a turbine, right? Sorry it took till week three to get there. Um, I think we needed to know some stuff. Now you've got all the, the foundations. We can start to talk about using heat to create work, which is, um, which is what we care about. Compressed liquid water at a pressure of 10 megapascals and a temperature of 60 degrees C. Okay, so it's, it's water, um, liquid water, is turned into saturated steam vapor in a boiler at a constant pressure. So we've got an isobaric process, we've got maybe we're burning coal or natural gas to run the boiler, and we're adding heat to this liquid water, and it's becoming, so it's not changing its pressure, but it's changing its internal energy, its enthalpy, and it's um, obviously gonna change its temperature, it's gonna be a lot hotter, how much heat is required to be added to the boiler? The reason this is a question we care about is if we were designing the system, we want to know how much coal are we burning? And how many tons per hour of coal are we putting through this boiler? So that's question one. Uh, and part two is the steam then passes through a turbine where the pressure is reduced isentropically to one megapascal. What is the final state of the fluid? Isentropic, no change in entropy. What's the final state of the fluid? And 
what's the shaft work of the turbine? So how much work can we get out of the turbine? So this is a, this feels like a, quite a solid question. Um, we need to know some stuff. And for us, we'll turn to the table. So what we need is we need that the initial enthalpy, okay? We'll need the enthalpy at the exit of the boiler. You know what, let's just use numbers. Because that, right, we need H1, we need H2, and then after we go through our turbine, we'll have some H3. So we'll have a state one, we'll go into a boiler, we'll come out at state two, and then we'll go into a turbine, and we'll come in at state three. And we need to know the enthalpy at those three state points in order to complete this, to answer this question. So we have tables that show us the properties of water at its, at its compressed liquid state. This for you is table A10, probably. Table A9. Table A9, properties of compressed liquid water. It's listed last, they're the least detailed and we kind of care least about them. Um, and I can show you why. This is the, this is the actual table from the textbook, obviously. I've, I've scanned it in. Um, five megapascal, 10 megapascal, 15 megapascal, up to 50 megapascal. The reason they're the least detailed is you can see that the properties don't change. If we said compressed liquid water at 80 degrees C and we looked at the internal energy, right? So you can see that to go from 5 megapascals to 10 megapascals, you've got like 0.3% of a change in property. That's a massive amount of compression for very little um, change in properties. And that's why these tables aren't very detailed. Um, and we'll talk about what happens if you have five, you know, 6 or 7 megapascals um, when we talk about interpolation. So that's an example of that. That's the table. Um, this tells you the saturation temperature at that pressure. So this says above that temperature you can't get compressed liquid water because the water will vaporise. So what do we say? We wanted 10 megapascals pressure and 60 uh, degrees C, so we need that figure there. Can someone write that down? 259.5. So that's the enthalpy which is the internal energy as represented by having uh, temperature and the pressure energy associated with um, being at pressure and volume. And you can see there's not very much difference between U and H for compressed liquid water as well. Um, it doesn't have that much volume, it's quite dense. Um, so the pressure energy isn't very much. But let's remember, so it starts with H1 is 259 and a half degrees. Ah, kilojoules per kilogram. Good. The next table that we care about, and we've already seen it, is a saturated water table. It's table A6 and A7. In Rysel, um, Rogers and Mayhu also has um, information. All of the thermodynamics texts will have it. And this takes us in that quality region. So it takes us from saturated liquid water to saturated vapour. It's listed first, it's the one we refer to the most, and it's the most detailed. Um, because the properties of water change the most inside that region. Um, so this is an example of that. And we said we were heating up, we said we were adding heat in our boiler at a constant pressure. So 10 megapascals, we probably need... Oh, difference between table A6 and A7. Table A6 lists temperature first and does temperature in nice neat increments, 60 degrees, 90 degrees, right, nice neat increments. The pressures are listed second and come out as weird numbers, right? Table, that's table A6. Table A7 lists pressure first and lists pressure in nice easy increments. 0 0.02, 0 0.04, 0 0.1. Lists temperature second and temperature comes out as weird numbers. So if you're told you're compressing something between a pressure and a pressure, then you go to the pressure table. If you're told between the temperature and the temperature, go to the temperature table, you'll find them to be, the data is the same data, um, just represented with a different emphasis. So in our example, we were 
going to 10 megapascals and we're going to saturated vapour. I might need the document camera. We will see. The second listed tables are then superheated steam tables. So this is what happens in this region here. So when the steam is superheated, and we often superheat steam. And our boiler will often take it beyond saturation. Um, we'll talk about that later, I think. Yep. Go. So this is your superheated steam table. Go. My, um, my clicker is broken. If you, oh, it's, it's not working at the moment. If you should. So this is superheated steam tables. Just notice that. And so again, it lists the saturation temperature at the top, notice that the earliest superheated steam that we get is steam that's 45.8 degrees C. You say, well, that doesn't sound superheated, but at low pressures, it's considered superheated. So you can have steam at 50 degrees C, and it's superheated steam, meaning that it's not just about to condense um, any water out of solution. And you've got specific volume, internal energy, and so forth. So you've got steam tables there as well, and that goes up to 40 MPa, I believe. So, if we answered our question, so compressed liquid water at 60 degrees and 10 megapascals, which was that number there, is heated in a boiler to a pressure of 10 megapascals and saturated vapor, is that number there, okay? So we've gone to HG, because that's our vapor phase, our gas phase for water, and we've read across the 10 megapascal line. And the question is, so that's the 60 degree line and the 10 megapascal line. The question is how much heat needs to be added in the boiler? And so we'll find that heat from phase one to two will equal 2724.7 minus 259.5 and that'll be 2500 anyone <coughs> give me a number oops back back I say back did anyone do that calculation it'll be about 2500 100 kilojoules per kilogram of energy has to be added to the water to both heat it up to, so initially the energy is added to get it from 60 degrees to 311 degrees, so sensible, sensible heat, and then the energy is added to get it from its liquid state across to its gaseous state. Okay? And that's pretty much how we do calculations with steam tables. There's lots of examples in PSS3 of find this property, subtract these two properties. Um, you need to be comfortable with reading steam tables. We'll finish this topic, I think. Um, basically, so within thermo, you've got two working fluids. You've got ideal gases, actually on my chart, ideal gases over here. You've got ideal gases, and when we're dealing with ideal gases, we use equations. So we use PV equals MRT, we use T1 on T2 equals P1 on P2 to the power of N minus 1 over N, something like that. Um, for compression processes, right, lots of equations and formulas to deal with ideal gases to determine our properties. Um, you know, Q equals MC delta T, that sort of thing, right? For our pure substances, which is the thing we've introduced this week and we'll continue to talk about tomorrow. Lots of tables, right? No formulas, well, there's one formula. Um, we'll get to that tomorrow. Not so much formulas to determine the difference between um, properties. Lots of um, table reading, okay? You need to have a very clear line in your own mind as to when you're dealing with which one. And I. I I don't want to mock anyone who might be in the room because they probably failed the subject, but when, if for the final exam last year, 
I had some students, and it was, it, was, it was far more common than I wish it was. But I said, like, the exam question was something like, air at 15 degrees C is drawn through a compressor. Um, it's 15 degrees C, one atmosphere, drawn through a compressor to four atmospheres. What's the change in whatever? Internal energy, right? Um, I had students look at the table, look at the water tables. So I said air is drawn through a compressor. And they said, well, at one atmosphere and 15 degrees C, that's compressed liquid water. And they did the whole question like it was, it was water. Um, and they got marked very badly, because it's really hard to evidence um, an understanding of thermodynamics when you're making that level of mistake on the way in. Um, which is why I say I just want to be sensitive about it, because they, they might still be with me in the subject. So just be clear in your own mind when you're talking about an ideal gas or you're talking about a pure substance. Um, the question we will ask ourselves, yeah, I'll finish this. The question we'll ask ourselves tomorrow is, what happens if we didn't go to 10 megapascals or 8 megapascals, but instead went to 9 megapascals? What do we do? How do the tables help us? We'll wrap up there. Thanks for your patience. It's thick material. I'll see you tomorrow.